<laughs> Dude, never did it. Welcome back to Never Did It. I'm Jake Ziegler, and I'm here with Brad Garoon. On uh, Never Did It, we look back at the last 100 years of movie history in an effort to fill in some of our own movie blind spots. Today, we're covering the year 2018. Brad, why don't you tell me the movie that you chose for me from 2018 and tell me why you chose it? Yeah, okay. I gave you mid-90s. Uh, I watched this at the beginning of the pandemic and really liked it and realized that no one I knew had seen it, even though I remembered it being... Kind of a big deal that Jonah Hill was directing a movie and that it was good. So I checked it out and I really, really liked it. And um, now I finally have someone to talk about it with. <laughs> this is a movie about, it's a coming of age story taking place in the 90s about a boy. Where are they? Southern California, I want to say. Yeah, Los Angeles. And he's in a, he's got a troubled home. His dad's not around. His mom is busy and his brother is abusive. And he sees a bunch of kids skateboarding and sees that they're like bros with each other and wants some of that in his life and becomes bros with them. And then it's just about a story of his life being their bud and the complications that come with that and having an abusive family. I love it. What do you think? I liked it a lot, too. And um, yeah, I don't know why I had never seen it, because I, I, I certainly knew about it. I like Jonah Hill a lot. Uh, I you know knew that he had directed a movie and it was yeah on my radar. And I don't know why I had never seen it. So I'm glad uh, that, you know, I was finally compelled to uh, for the podcast. Yeah, it's very good. The boy in it is excellent. Uh, gosh, I've already forgotten his name. Sonny Sujlik, I think, or something like that. Yeah. What has he done since then? Has he been in anything? Well, he was in stuff before then, too. He was in Killing of a Sacred Deer. He was the son. In okay, that. I missed that one, actually. That's another one I missed. Never oh, did. you got to get up on your Yorgos. Yeah, we're going to probably do that. Megan has also, my wife has not seen The Lobster, uh, so we'll probably do that, I, which I really like, The Lobster. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure if we'll do Dogtooth or not, because I think that one might just be too weird for her. Fair enough. I haven't seen Dogtooth, but I'm going to. I'm very excited to get it. It's into really that. weird. And of course, I saw it because it was a foreign, uh, best foreign film. They were still calling it foreign film, not international, but it was a best foreign film nominee back in like 2010. So it was before, you know, The Favorite and even Lobster and everything. So like, I didn't really know who Yorgos Lanthimos was, but I saw it. And yeah, it's uh, it's out there. Sorry, we're off track. The mid 90s. <laughs> yeah, I'll pull it back in. So yeah, Sonny Suljic, I, I'm, I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong. The first thing I ever saw him in was The House with the Clock in Its Walls, the Eli oh, Roth yeah. children's movie, which is pretty solid actually yeah that movie made my kid cry when we saw it really i took my little my half brother to see it and he was very young then and mm -hmm. we both had a good time yeah she uh she didn't like when when the kid got yelled at by by adults and that she was <laughs> she, she was very hurt by that <laughs> that's amazing yeah so suljic plays he ends up being kind of a villain in the movie because he befriends the awkward main character but then turns on him that's and right. then since then he hasn't done a ton but he did do a small role in a movie that I now want to see really badly called North Hollywood, which was directed by one of the producers of this movie and is also about skateboarding. Oh, I think it might be more modern, although in the trailer, I didn't see anyone recording anything with a cell phone. And if we know one thing about skateboarders, it's that they are always recording themselves. So always. I can't imagine that North Hollywood is contemporary. It must be a period piece, just like mid 90s. Uh, mm -hmm. Vince Vaughn's in that and a bunch of people I don't recognize. Although some people who are uh, Gen Z or younger millennial actors like um, Nico Haraga, who you might have seen. He was in um, Booksmart and Moxie. Mm -hmm. Those are those are two movies I like a lot. So he's in that. He's really good. But back to mid 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Sonny Suljic's really good. Uh, he's in, I think probably every frame of the movie, too. I mean, he carries the entire thing. I can't think of well, there might there's one scene near the end where he's spoiler alert, fast forward 30 seconds. If you don't want to know how the movie ends, mm -hmm. even though this isn't really a plot driven movie, there's some stuff that like not knowing it helps build the tension towards the end of the movie here. The spoiler starts now when when the kids in the hospital, there's the scene where his mom goes out to the waiting room and sees all the friends sleeping there and like accepts them. So that's a frame or two where he's not yeah, in the right. movie. There's multiple shots where he's not in the movie. Yeah, but that's, I mean, yeah, that that's about it. I mean, he really carries like the entire movie and he's really, really good in it too. Incredible. I, we, we talk, we don't talk actually that much about child actors on the show, but we should because it's tough. Mm -hmm. Even not even child actors. Last night, Annie and I watched Murder by Death. Have you ever seen that? No. It's awful. It's um, <laughs> so about eight years before Clue. They did a spoof of murder mysteries called Murder by Death. And the like instigator character is played by Truman Capote. Oh, and he's <laughs> terrible. 
He's yeah. not an actor. <laughs> so, so bad. The movie's awful. It's really racist, really homophobic. The fact that Clue exists means no one should remember Murder by Death, but we watched it because there's that new show on FX called Feud, Tr- Capote versus the Swans, and they depict a scene from it in the movie. I mean, My wife show. is watching it. Yeah, she's watching that show. So when we saw that scene, we're like, oh, we got to watch that movie. Yeah. <laughs> Wish we hadn't. Mm-hmm. Um, it's awful. Anyway, I think we may have talked about this on the podcast, but I saw uh, Teacher's Lounge which is up for, we'll talk about it next week because it's up for Best International Film at the Oscars, even though it may not deserve it because Taste of Things didn't get nominated. <laughs> but Teacher's Lounge has a ton of child actors in it and they're all great. Um, and my review of it was, we need to look at why American child actors are not good because these kids are so good. <laughs> and all the kids in this are good too, even though Sonny Suljic and what's his name from Lady Bird? Uh, Lucas Hedges. Yeah, Lucas Hedges. Hedges. Yeah. He's not a child anymore when by the time this movie came out, but he was a right. good child actor. And all the other kids are too, and they're not actors. They're skateboarders. Right. It's cool. Yeah. Well, I had loved, I like seeing Lucas Hedges in this too, because he's played a lot different character in uh, a movie I almost chose for you for 2016. He was, uh, he he's an Oscar nominee already. He was in Manchester by the Sea. Mm. Uh, much different role a much different performance uh and, and he was so so good in that so i was, re- I was happy to see him and something else too because i think between manchester by the sea and then boy erased and this was really those were really like the only things i've seen him in well you've um, seen Lady Bird. oh and Lady Bird, right yeah of course but yeah i feel like i haven't hadn't seen him in a while kind of, kind of fallen off a little bit are you telling me you haven't seen ben is back the julia roberts movie you know what i actually haven't i forgot that movie existed <laughs> no one's seen it yeah <laughs> but now that you mentioned it, i remember hearing it was like good but just that yeah. nobody kind of saw it yeah yeah yeah, I don't know. Let's look up. What's Lucas Hedges up to? I, I was listening to a different movie podcast recently where they compared because he and Timothy Chalamet were both in Lady Bird and they both played the romantic or or would be romantic partners for Sir Ronan. And it was interesting that Chalamet's star Rose and Lucas Hedges didn't really. What? Else? Oh, he was also. Yeah, he used to be in all the Wes Anderson movies, too, because he was in Moonrise Kingdom. And he was in Grand Budapest Hotel. Oh, wow. Right. He was in three billboards. But I, I bet he's that in a while, I guess. Yeah, that's one that was a big deal, big controversial deal at the time. Oh, you know what? I just we talked about this on the podcast recently, but mm-hmm. during the pandemic, he was in Let Them All Talk, which I really liked. The sort Oh yeah, I didn't see that, but yeah, I remember you you saying that. He was very good in that, and then he's got a movie come out coming out next year called Shirley about Shirley Chisholm. Yeah. yeah, that's been talked about for a while. I think that was supposed to come out maybe last year or something, and it got pushed back for whatever reason. Well, who knows with releases anymore? Like Mickey 17 now released indefinitely. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess that, that happened a few weeks ago, and, and this Coyote Acne movie is not coming out. So that's don't even get me started. I'm very worried. Whenever yeah. I hear a movie is being produced at Warner, I'm like, don't do that. That's right. Like, don't tell me. Yeah. Hopefully Dune 3 will actually happen. Who else? Who plays the mom in this? Uh, Catherine Waterston. Uh, yeah. She is in the Fantastic Beasts movies, which started off as OK and get progressively worse, like really bad. And uh, she's also in Inherent Vice, which is uh, probably not Paul Thomas Anderson's best, but uh, she's very good in it. Well, I don't like it. Inherent Vice. I think it's like very mid. Right. I remember her like kind of coming on the scene with um, Alien Resurrection. Oh, wow. I That's... first became aware of her. Really that long ago? Late 90s? These names are so interchangeable. Alien Covenant was where I first really became aware. Covenant. Of okay, yeah, there we go. Yeah. The Resurrection um, was one in 97. Yeah, and I saw Logan Lucky, and I know she's in it. And Oh, yeah, I liked that movie. I don't remember her being in it. I don't remember her being in it either. We always have to shout out multiple Soderbergh things if we can. Yeah. I mean, um, there's so many. It's so easy to do. Like, give us a break. Let me catch up. <laughs> and she was in Babylon, but I have no memory of her being in Babylon. I don't either. I've tried to block out as much of Babylon as possible. I don't I don't hate Babylon. I do. Tell me. So tell me what, what do you think about the stunt? What do you think about stunt casting in general? Oh, stunt casting? What do you mean? Like like casting people who aren't actors? Uh, I think, you know, in a lot of situations, it, it's uh, it, it works in, in a lot of situations. I definitely think it worked in mid 90s. Yes, I think it, it adds it added to an authenticity to it. I, I think in a lot of cases it works. I think it works more the way they do it in mid There's two different kinds of stunt casting. You know, there can be something like, you know, what they did in mid 90s, which is casting, you know, like non actors in parts. But then there's also like a, a stunt casting like of Mike Myers in that scene in Bohemian Rhapsody is, is another form of like stunt casting where you're you're casting a certain person to elicit a certain reaction that may or not be related to the movie and in the bohemian rhapsody's case it's not it's to get a reaction from you know a scene in wayne's world which is just so beyond the point but uh stunt casting in general i mean case by case basis but i I definitely think it can work and it it definitely worked in mid 90s yeah you like sean baker movies yes i definitely yeah i like the florida project Uh, i like tangerine yeah i definitely like that i saw i watched red rocket a few months ago and it's probably got the most professional actors of any of his movies Mm -hmm. and i thought it was great but yeah tangerine's awesome 
really dark but awesome same yeah. with the Florida project yeah he's he's really good and this this actually reminded me a lot of his movies although i think it's meant to also feel like a larry clark movie like because it's got it kind of has kids vibes yeah well when i liked about the whole i think i texted you this but i like the whole vibe of mid 90s where it literally looked like it was shot in the 70s i mean the way just the visual uh aesthetic of it and then uh you mentioned this a little bit earlier too it's not so much plot driven as character driven so it really mm -hmm. felt like that kind of uh like that kind of movie i know we've mentioned this several times on the podcast but it was a little bit you know it has like that kind of 70s vibe that last detail i knew you were gonna cite last detail you yeah of course but i mean it just keeps coming up you know it's like it's uh it's just kind of this this you know one period of the, of uh this this 13 year old kid's life you know it's like a couple months uh you know of this kid's life and uh you, you know be you know hanging out with these these guys that he you know looks up to uh you know like really looks up to especially um was right. it ray ray's the one yeah ray's one without a nickname because he's so cool he doesn't need one you know and he's got some really nice scenes with ray and that guy is really good yeah it's just uh it's just a really well-made movie i mean for a debut film uh you know actor turned director it's it's really strong and uh yeah i'm surprised jonah hill hasn't there hasn't been like anything in development for him to do another feature at all. And this was, you know, six years ago. I was really surprised when I saw his documentary about his therapist on Netflix. It was an interestingly made movie. It's mm. not amazing, but it's good. In hindsight, given the controversy that came out about him after that, that he uses what he learns in therapy to control women in, in relationships, unfortunate and kind of makes Stutz feel cheap, which is a shame because that guy Stutz has been a celebrity therapist for a long time. I first heard about him because he was a guest on Mar Mark Maron's show because Maron was seeing him for a little bit. And it, you know, it just, it's too bad that the guy who made Stutz, who put Stutz on film, <laughs> uses those tools in a really nasty, manipulative way. So that's probably why we're not hearing from Jonah Hill right now. Certainly. And Before I wouldn't be, that maybe, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's been six years. So I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's going to be a minute. And if we do yeah. hear from Jonah Hill again from behind the camera, it's going to be maybe a movie he doesn't produce in the United States. A la, I mean, he's not a pariah like Woody Allen's a pariah, but that's what like Woody Allen and, uh, you know, Polanski had to do. Right. Maybe he goes down the David O. Russell route and just makes movies that no one sees and are bad. We saw Amsterdam and guess what? It's bad. Yeah. So someone, I forget who it was, uh, where I heard them say, yeah, Taylor Swift has not like flexed in a film yet, even though she did that like director on director with Martin McDonough uh, mm -hmm. last year and then didn't end up directing a film. She did the Eras tour movie instead. But it's like, no, she was in Amsterdam and had like kind of a pivotal role, even though yeah. it was stupid. It's very small, but she's like kind of a, a major plot. Like what happens to her is like a major plot point. Yeah. Right. So she's been in a movie. Anyway, we're getting away. Supposedly from she's still directing one, too. That's in development. We'll see what happens supposedly i don't care what she does she's she's still awesome you're such a fan it's interesting so it's clearly it flew under the radar a little bit not a lot of it I and mean, if you're a movie fan you've heard of it i love it i gave this five stars i was so taken by it yeah i gave it four stars but again you know as so happens often i it might be more of a four and a half i did i really really liked it um and uh, my wife megan watched it with me too and she felt similarly she might have even given it five stars as well we both uh, really enjoyed it and we're really happy that we watched it and it's short gosh it's only like an hour and 25 minutes or something it, it probably could have even gone on a little they could have probably done a little more uh with it but yeah we we both really liked it before we move on i just want to give a quick shout out to a movie called skate kitchen if you're looking for a movie that came out like two months before this about very similar stuff but from the female point of view oh skate, skate kitchen i'm pretty sure it's on tubi or canopy or, or is, you can stream it for free somewhere i love tubi so this was an A24 movie. Maybe that is why it flew a little under the radar. And now let's talk about a different A24 movie that if you're a horror fan, definitely did not fly under the radar. And even if you're not, if you're like me, you've been afraid of it for years. Well, it was at the time still, it was their most successful movie. Mm. Uh, I think it was until Everything Everywhere All at Once, actually. It was their most successful box office movie. So we're talking about Hereditary, Ari Aster's debut, from one debut to another. Tell me why you made me watch Hereditary. <laughs> well, uh, for 2018, again, you know, you'd seen a lot of the movies, uh, you know, a lot of the big ones from that year. And, you know, we'd seen a lot of the same ones. And I know you like Ari Aster. You know, I know you'd seen you've seen Midsummer, right? Midsummer and Bo is Afraid, and I and love both. Yeah, and I knew you. Yeah, I knew you liked both of those. So I knew you liked Ari Aster, and I was like, and I know you don't see a lot of horror movies, so yeah, you know, and I uh, and and I really like this movie, and I know there was just you know a lot of a lot of hubbub about it. You know, like I said, big movie for a twenty four. You know, there's been just a lot of talk about it, and I think it's awesome. I I you know watched it again for this. I still think it's awesome, and uh, yeah, I thought it was it would be uh, it would be a fun one to talk about. So Ari Aster has gotten less deranged 
as his uh, <laughs> career has gone on. I don't know if you've heard about his short film that made him very famous, but I'm not going to talk about it on here because it's so disgusting. And then he made Hereditary, which is just a straight up horror movie. Now that I've seen it, I would say much more so than I expected it to be. It was a straight up horror movie. Mm -hmm. And then he made the second some half. Well, the first half, some surprising things happen, mm -hmm. but there's, it's still like creepy. But yes, absolutely. In the second half, it's like it's a haunted house movie, basically, in the second half. Yeah. And then he made Midsommar, which I, I had never seen anything like it. Uh, well, can't say that because I've seen the original. I was going to say Matchstick Men, but that's not right. Um, <laughs> uh, Wicker Man? The original Wicker Man. Yeah. Which is similar, but not as visceral. And there are more virgins in the original Wicker Man than there are in <laughs> Midsommar <laughs> and adult virgin men. And then here, and then he made Bo is Afraid, which is I, I, it's really hard to explain, but I thought I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I do, too. So uh, first, why don't you tell us what Hereditary is about? And then we'll talk about how we feel about it. Right. Yeah. Hereditary is uh, it's about a family. Typical family. He's got a uh, mom who works. She's a she's a miniature artist. Uh, the dad is. I, I'm not even sure what his job is, but the mom is uh, Tony Collette. Uh, the dad is played by Gabriel Byrne. They have two children, uh, a 16-year-old named Peter. He's played by Alex Wolf from the uh, Jumanji movies. And then they have a daughter, a 13-year-old daughter named Charlie, who has played Millie Shapiro. You know, they're a family of four. And the the opening of the movie is them dealing with the the passing of the the grandmother of the family. Tony Collette's mom is has has just passed, and they're kind of dealing with the aftermath of that. She was apparently a very secretive, uh, very difficult woman to get to know, but she did have a very special bond with. Uh, charlie the daughter well hold on because you've you've set up the movie but what's the movie about well and then the movie it's i'm trying uh trying to think of how to explain it without giving you know without like giving away too many of the plot okay without too many of the plot details especially like the the, the big surprise in, in the first half because when i first saw that movie i, I saw it kind of right when it came out in the theater and i had no idea i can't even imagine happened. watching the movie under those circumstances like i knew what was what was coming mm -hmm. because it was such a big deal when that happened in the theater honestly I think if I was watching it and didn't know that was happening and then it happened, I might turn it off. I lived with the sound of it for like a week after the movie. It was it was just so shocking. And it just it set the movie off and like on a completely different tone. Should we should we do a spoiler alert? And then, you know, you can fast forward if you if you haven't seen Hereditary. Yeah. Let me just say this. Up to this point, it kind of feels like Rosemary's Baby, where it's like mm -hmm. there's there's a weird vibe. Clearly something's off about this girl. The, the daughter in the family. By the way, Millie Shapiro, I first became aware of her because um, I love Matilda the musical. Uh, I saw it on Broadway. Four different girls played Matilda on Broadway, and I saw it with Una Lawrence. I got home and researched, like, is Una Lawrence, who's incredible, and you may have seen Una Lawrence in, like, she was in The Beguiled, she was in Pete's Dragon, Southpaw, Lamb, that movie. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that. But Millie Shapiro was one of the other four girls who was in it. And so clearly very talented musically, too, on top of everything. And then for the first in the beginning of this movie, she's just a freaking weirdo. And you're like, what's wrong with this girl? Uh, we can start the spoiler alert right here. At one point, she cuts off the head of a bird. <laughs> seemingly no reason. It's a dead bird, but still really creepy. And then she keeps it. And then what happens, Jake? Uh, there, there's a party. There's a uh, uh, the, the, the Peter is going to a, a party. Uh, his mom uh, wants Peter to take Charlie along to the party because she, you know, again, it's kind of weird. Doesn't really hang out with many kids. She wants Charlie to get out of the house and and do something normal with kids. You know, go to a party. Charlie, of course, as we've learned earlier, has a uh, debilitating nut allergy, so she cannot, ha you know, can't have any nuts. She agrees to go to this party. Uh, Peter agrees to take her. Peter, again, by all accounts, Peter seems like a pretty normal kid. Seems, you know, he's nice to his sister. He doesn't really, you know, fight taking her to the party. He's like, sure, you know, I'll take her, whatever. Uh, so he takes her to this party and he goes off to smoke weed with some of his friends. And a girl he's trying to hook up with. And the girl he's trying to hook up with, of course. I mean, he's 16. Of course, he's trying to yeah. hook up with the girl. While he's off, off with the girl and those friends, the sister, Charlie, she eats a brownie or a cake or something with walnuts in it. So she goes into anaphylactic shock. So again, Peter being a good brother, you know, picks her up, takes her out of there, starts driving to the hospital, you know, driving really fast. It's late at night. It's totally dark. She's struggling to breathe, you know, like her throat's closing up. She opens the window, sticks her head out, uh, you know, to get some air or whatever. She sticks her head out. He sees a deer in the road. So he swerves. And as he swerves, her face connects with a telephone pole and rips her head off. It's awful. And the sound of it is so gross because that I lived with it. Like I kept hearing, like I would hear it in my dream i mean it was it was so uh just viscerally affecting and I, again i had no idea this was coming i had read nothing about the movie because i purposely try to avoid you know reading anything i don't even watch trailers because i don't want to know about movies before i see them so this, i had no idea this was coming and it was just so shocking to see that because i didn't i just had no idea
So I knew pretty much every plot beat of this movie before I saw it. And I saw it for the first time last week. I was confused when I, I remember when it came out, I had a friend and coworker at the time and he was a big horror guy and had seen it and hated it. And he told me all about it and I couldn't understand why he hated it. And then I learned more about it. I'm like, oh, it's paced much more slowly than a typical horror movie. It's not a slasher film. It's a psychological horror movie. And it's, and it's really messed up. Yeah. So I knew about the decapitation, and then I also knew about, more spoilers if you've landed here, more spoilers. I also knew about the decapitation later in the movie. Uh, I still watch these things with like finger lace in front of my eyes because I (laughs) hate this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's gnarly, man. It's gross. It's gross. And I was not, I, I, so I knew all the plot beats, but I didn't know all the images that would be on screen. So when they show the remains of that accident a little bit later in the movie, I was very upset and grossed (laughs) out. (laughs) So I liked it. Because, okay, uh, I mentioned this to you in a tech. I don't really know how to talk about this without sounding like I don't like the movie because I do like it. Mm -hmm. But I think some of the praise for it, and it is a, you know, it's amongst the general public, I think there's mixed feelings about it. But amongst movie lovers, it's pretty universally loved. Yeah, I'd say it's fair. I think some of the praise for it's overblown uh, for two reasons. One, I think the script in the second half of the movie is pretty dumb. Like a lot of the dialogue is really bad and it is pretty much just a a haunted house film. On the other hand, oh, and and we'll talk about Toni Collette and the whole Oscar controversy around her. It's not really controversy, but Oscar wishes around her in a little bit. I think the movie is much, much, much more interesting to watch if you watch it through the lens that there's nothing supernatural going on and that this is just a family that is having a mass psychosis. Interesting. Yeah. Which I think is a totally reasonable way to view the movie. And I had said to you, I want to compare this to Tar when we were talking about it beforehand. And I think Tar is more interesting if you go the other way. If you Mm -hmm. think of Tar as a ghost story, which is, I think, a completely reasonable read of that movie, Mm -hmm. then it's much more interesting. And if you watch Hereditary and understand it, that what you're seeing is just through the eyes of the characters in the movie, but not necessarily the reality of what's happening, then it's much more interesting. Uh, because the movie starts out being about my mother had these problems. She goes to her first like Grievers Anonymous meeting, and she talks mm-hmm. about all the mental illness in every member of her family. Yep. And for that reason, you know, her husband doesn't believe her as she starts, you know, thinking she can reconnect with Millie in the afterlife and mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And because of that, I think it's reasonable to assume. Oh, and there's other stuff like the cult that is the center of the, you know, the maliciousness in this movie. They find their literature and it says things like the vessel, the the male vessel that this demon wants. He the male vessel has to be completely like made vulnerable. And I think that means uh, you know, through mental degradation. Mm-hmm. And and that clearly is happening. What was what's the son's name? Charlie? Uh, no, Peter is the son. Peter, right. Charlie is the daughter. Charlie's the daughter. Yep. If that's happening to people, like you're seeing him be tortured as the movie goes on. Mm-hmm. And I think it's reasonable to say that there's a read of the movie where Tony Collette snaps pretty early on, like right after, you know, a little bit after her mom dies, but completely after Charlie dies. And her relationship with Peter after that is so contentious that it starts and Peter's guilt over what happened is so contentious that it starts a mental deterioration for him. Mm -hmm. So at the, at the very end of the movie, when he spoiler alert again, (laughs) jumps out of the attic window after seeing his, or after seeing his mom take piano wire to her own neck. Oh, that speaking of sounds. Oh my gosh. I I hated it. So, and also the, like the slow and then faster, it was awful. Yeah. Seeing that and jumping out the window, that's a psychotic break, not a a physical death. Mm -hmm. And then when he stands up and sees his mother's lifeless body floating into the attic, I think you can read that as he is carrying his mother's lifeless body into the attic. And then all those people really are there, but they've driven him to psychosis. I think the movie's much, much more interesting if you watch it that way. Otherwise, it's not that much different than like other ghost movies. Mm-hmm. Um, except that there's good actors in it. Very good actors. Yeah. I mean, I think both the, both the kids are great. And uh, Gabriel Byrne, I think is another one of those guys who kind of flies under the radar uh, a little bit because he's got to be, I mean, he's really the, the calm 
amongst the storm in this movie. You know, Tony Collette is obviously, uh, you know, going through a lot. You know, her mother dies, and then her, you know, as her her daughter dies, and she's, you know, having a psychotic breakdown. The boy is going through just like you said, is getting tortured and everything. And, and Gabriel Byrne is just trying to keep it all together. He's the calm, yeah. the calm one in this movie, so he's got a lot to, you know, kind of a lot to carry uh, with the acting. And he's he's really good in this too. I think they're all really very good. I totally agree. I think Gabriel Byrne is totally underrated here, mm-hmm. doing very little. Although there was one moment where I was like, does he even care that his daughter died? He's not acting like he does. <laughs> but uh, but aside from that, yeah, he's wonderful. Who, who did you say plays Peter? What's his name? Um, Alex Wolf. This is the best he's ever been in anything. He's he, Oh, definitely. He is tremendous. Yeah. And also the movie is shot beautifully like if nothing else it's very clear right from the beginning that Aster knows how to set a mood knows how to make a shot look interesting yes and ratchet up tension which he does in all of his movies even the ones that aren't horror movies so yeah all of that I mean I don't have a bad thing to say except I think the script (laughs) is kind of stupid I think the dialogue is like a little dumb you can hand wave that away pretty easily by saying well these are people who are losing their minds Mm -hmm. so why would they be saying anything profound right that's fine. Oh, uh, and Dowd too is a, has a, a small kind of pivotal part too. Is kind of one of the main again it's another spoiler, but right? Yeah, but she's a you know part a member of the cult. Uh, she's got a very small part, but she's one of those actors too. Who whenever she shows up in something, um, she's kind of like character actor Margot Martindale. Oh my God, you just took the words out of my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, it took me a second. It's like, is that character actress Margot? No, it's not. It's Anne Dowd. It took me a second, but um, I, I kind of put you know there. She's she's kind of like that too. Anne Dowd only needs uh, a few minutes to make a, a strong impression. She's really good in this too. They also look. I mean, they do look a little bit alike. Character actress Margot Martindale and character actress. Sand Dowd um, <laughs> look a little bit alike. And I'm sorry for taking the Bojack Horseman title and giving it to someone else as well. But yeah, <laughs> um, but it's true. Like the two of them, my brother turned 18 and we were like, we can watch whatever movie you want. And he turned on Cocaine Bear. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I really didn't want to. I was like, I have no interest in this. Um, but character actress Margot Martindale's in it. So and she's funny in it. Too. I watched it. I kind of liked it. Um, I got through about 20 minutes of it and I had to leave. I, I yeah. couldn't, I couldn't deal. It's not my, <laughs> but I, I thought cocaine bear was, was totally okay. Okay. And well, you know, fine. respect to Ray Liotta. I think that was, wasn't that Ray Liotta's last movie? I think it was. Yeah. You never know with the way things get released. Um, right. But yeah, I, I get it. I, I mean, look, you, you probably rated it higher than you rated freaking real life, which I think is crazy. I like, certainly did. Yeah, absolutely. I hate this. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Let's talk about Tony Collette. Yes. All right. So everyone loves Tony Collette's performance in this movie to the Mm. point that people were really upset that she and were just blasting the Academy of Motion Pictures that she didn't get nominated for Best Actress in 2019 for this 2018 film. Mm -hmm. So you you brought that up a couple days ago. And so I looked up the slate of Best Actress. Maybe in another year, you could I think you could make that argument. I don't think this year you could make the argument that she deserved to be there more than any of these people. Now, you made the argument to me via text that Yalitza Aparicio, maybe you'd give it to her over her in Roma. And I looked at my, and we'll talk about this more when we get into our top of the year lists. Mm-hmm. I looked at my list and indeed, I liked Hereditary more than I liked Roma. I mean, I know that just inherently, but mm-hmm. but even then, I made a little list of other people who I liked more than Tony Collette this mm-hmm. year that I would put in first. First being Natalie Portman in Annihilation. Oh, yeah, very good. Incredible. Thomasin McKenzie in Leave No Trace. Great movie. I don't know how to pronounce this woman's name, so I'm going to do my best, but I think it's Haldora Gerharo's daughter. So she's obviously Scandinavian Mm -hmm. in the movie Woman at War, which is, have you seen Woman at War? I have not, no. Oh, highly recommend. Really good. I heard that Jodie Foster wanted to direct an American version with herself in the lead, which oh. she, she'd be appropriate for the role. Yeah. Interesting. And then also Charlize Theron and Tully, I thought. could. Yeah. Uh, she was very good. Uh, also, I can point to, I, I'm one of the people who does think Tony Clip, but how about uh, Elsie Fisher, eighth grade? I thought was also excellent that year. That movie makes my skin crawl, but I can't deny what you're saying is right. I have a daughter in sixth grade. How do you, I mean, how do you think it makes me feel? <laughs> sure, fair enough. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, 2018 was a great, great year. And well, who I, were the other who were the other four nominees? I know we oh, mentioned so, y- Yalitza from Roma, but who were the other four? So Glenn Close and The Wife, and I know people very, feel different things in The Wife. But I think that movie's awesome. It's very good. I really like it too. I watched it on an airplane, and I was like, "This plane should not land while I am watching this." <laughs> and I hate flying, but I still felt that way. Mm. Olivia Coleman in The Favorite, and we. And you had mentioned like she's she might you could argue she's more of a supporting role in that movie. Mm. And I said, and I stick by this, then either Rachel Weiss or 
Emma Stone would be the lead, and they're both better than Tony Collette. I think all, all I think three of them were great. However, you yeah, and I said however you slice it, yeah, they're all they're all great. I love Olivia Coleman. I love the favorite. So yeah, yeah, and I actually can't remember the other two. Uh, the other two would be, would be Lady Gaga, uh, Star Is Born. It's a great movie. Uh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Star Is Born is great, uh, and she's great in it. And oh gosh. Oh, and the other one is uh, Melissa McCarthy. Can you ever forgive me? Who also is tremendous, and that's a really good movie. So um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was definitely a tough competition that year, and and I think part of the argument too is that yes, people are passionate about Tony Collette uh, in this role in this film, um, and, and I, I again, she probably would have been part of my five, although I definitely see the argument that yeah, the, all these women, there was a lot of great performances to choose from, but I think part of the larger argument is that the Academy ignores horror movies on the whole, uh, you know, yeah. just kind of as a general rule, and you know, yeah. here was a horror movie with, according to a lot of people, or a lot of people feel like was even you know a step up. Above horror movies and you know a great performance from a respected actor who already had an oscar nomination and who has appeared in like you know little miss sunshine and uh you know the sixth sense these best picture nominees so they're like if you know if they're gonna if they're gonna recognize horror you know this would be a time to do it and if they're not going to recognize this one then what do we have to do you know that i think that was sort of the frustration too like a, as a larger broader not attack but like you know just the, the academy's refusal to like really recognize horror movies Right. And I think that that's totally reasonable, especially given that in the past, and by the past, I mean like before we were born, oh, mm-hmm. not not totally before we were born, but largely before we were born, there have been horror movies nominated for Academy Awards, like The Exorcist. Mm-hmm. And in our lifetime, Silence of the Lambs. Mm-hmm. Now, Silence of the Lambs, you could say is, is a horror thriller, but The Exorcist isn't. That's just a horrible, horrible horror, horror movie. Right. <laughs> it still scares um, me. Yeah. But I guess around that time, it was happening more often because just a few years before that, you had Rosemary's Baby, which, you know, Ruth Gordon won Best Supporting Actress for for that movie. Mm -hmm. But it's rare, you know, even with those examples, it's still rare. Right, for sure. Although Silence of the Lambs, like, won every award. Yeah, that one swept up, swept. It was one of the only three movies have won uh, picture, director, lead actor, lead actress, and one of the screenplays, you know, original or adapted and Silence of the Lambs is one of them. And then it's one floor over the cuckoo's nest and it happened one night. Yeah. And those are the only three that I've ever done it. And the other interesting thing about Silence of the Lambs is that it came out in February of the year it came out. Like it didn't come out like during the height of Oscar time, like most of the, the best pictures tend to, and it still stuck around all year and ended up winning all the awards. So kind of a, kind of a cool little bit there. Yeah. Everything everywhere all at once also did that. Yep. Yeah. It was a March release and, and lasted through the whole year. Yeah. And then this year is kind of similar because you've got, I mean, it's not winter or spring, but you know, mm. summer blockbusters did that. So yeah, a couple of them. I think Tony Collette, uh, anyway, I haven't even said what I feel about her. Uh, I thought she did a good job. I think that the material she's given is a bit, look, she's, she's playing it hysterical and it's a role that is hysterical. But at times I was like, it's just so much screaming. It's, it's yeah. so <laughs> much screaming. She does it well, but I also thought because of the, and I think your explanation helps contextualize it a lot when it comes to like the genre stuff not winning but she was praised so much that i was like oh everyone else in the movie must have sucked but everyone's great i guess it's interesting because it does seem like ari aster is going to be shut out of us of the oscars forever based on just what he's interested in could be yeah be it either horror or just really upsetting drama (laughs) yeah or comedy in some in Mm -hmm. some cases like bo is afraid is actually pretty funny (laughs) oddly funny yeah yeah uh, it's a shame because he makes these stunning looking movies and I've been drawn into every one of them. And it's a it's a it's a real shame that he doesn't get a lot of awards recognition. Yeah. And hopefully it'll you know come for him someday. No Scorsese has been a big champion of his work. He says I think he says that Astor is like the best young filmmaker working today. So I mean, he's wow. you know, at least got some people in his corner. So and again, it's not all about Oscars. You know, it's, you know, it's good to have really interesting work recognized. You know, and I think Ari Astor is doing stuff that's just it's different from what yeah. anybody else is doing. Yeah. I like it a lot. And I and like we've said, I hate horror, and yet I'm really drawn to him. I, I'm really interested in the work he's doing. Well, one last thing. Um, I, I, saw, I saw an article, and I don't know if this is right because I couldn't find the interview with Aster, but I saw someone say somewhere that Aster was upset that people haven't picked apart what all the weird stuff in Bo is Afraid means in mm. like countless video essays, which one is not true. You can go on YouTube and search this. There's tons. Oh, yeah. But, but this was a really, really big thing for Midsommar and for Hereditary. And now having seen Hereditary and how in the last minute you don't need a video essay to help you explain what happened because the cult says <laughs> out loud the last few lines of the movie are just the cult running down for the audience this is what happened this is who he is yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was like oh that's disappointing I kind of wish I I, I kind of wish I think I would go I gave it four stars I think I would have gone four and a half 
had it been a little more ambiguous at the end. But any, but then again, if I if I'm being generous and watching it through, like I said in the beginning, the lens of this is not supernatural. This is a family losing their. The movie's called Hereditary. It's not titled that by accident. This is a family losing their mind because of the mental illness being passed down. Then it's a four and a half for me. Yeah, it's uh yeah, it's a four and a half for me. As is um yeah, I think it's really strong. How would you rank Astor's movies? The 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 three features. You know, I like all three of them a lot. Uh, so it feels weird to rank them in order, you know, like in chronological order. Mm -hmm. it, that makes it sound like those films are getting less good. I don't want to give that impression because I do really like them all, but I'd, I'd probably go Hereditary, Midsummer, and, and then Bo is Afraid. Mm. So I'd go Bo, uh, Midsummer, Bo is Afraid, Hereditary, with the same caveat as you. I think they're all excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's very close. Yeah. I, I like them all. All right. Well, let's rank some more good movies. Yeah, definitely. I have... Uh, I don't. I, I I do two lists. You know, I've got documentaries and features. Do do we want to just do features? Uh, no, add your documentaries because my number one movie of the year this year is a documentary. Oh no, I can't combine them. I'm just gonna do features. Okay, if you can't combine them, then just give me features. Uh, okay. With the with the, I guess I guess just know that my number one is a documentary. Yeah, well, that's fine. Okay, uh, what's your number ten? Uh, my number ten movie of 2018 is uh, another performance that a lot of people, or features another performance a lot of people felt like should have been up for an Oscar. Uh, Ethan Hawke in F Paul Schrader's First Reformed is my number ten movie of 2018. Yeah, that would definitely be on my list if uh, Letterbox had that sort set to uh, 20 set, 2018. Yeah, so, the, yeah, releases. Oh, it played at the Venice Film Festival, and then Telluride, and then Toronto, and lost. Yeah, just played at a bunch of film festivals in 2017. Got it. Got it. Well, when we get to, have we already done 2017 on the podcast? Nope, we have not. So when we get to 2017, just keep an eye out. That'll definitely be on my list. All right. So yeah, so my number nine is probably my favorite of the series, uh, Mission Impossible Fallout. Yeah, that movie is amazing and is much yeah. higher, a little bit higher on my list, actually. Oh, cool. Number eight is uh, a film from South Korea starring uh, Steven Yoon. It's called Burning. Uh, so it's not in my top 20, but it's just outside. That movie is so creepy. Yeah, very, but it's it's really good. I liked it a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, number seven is an anthology film from Joel and Ethan Cohen's called The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. It, it would it, it just misses my top ten. It's my number eleven. Ah, I love it. Um, also, I should say my number eleven since we're not doing past that. My number eleven is Hereditary. Oh, okay, fair enough. Is where that uh, landed. It, it's my number seventeen. Oh, nice. Okay. Number six for me is a film from Japan. It was a best international film uh, nominee that year. It's called Shoplifters. It's absolutely what? wonderful. Never did it. Oh, you'd, you would really like it. Uh, number five for me is uh, Avengers of Infinity War. Really like that one. That's the best of the bunch, if you ask yep. me. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think it is. Number four is a film that I don't think a lot of people have seen. I don't know if I've ever talked about it with anyone, uh, but it's a movie called Blind Spotting uh, with David Diggs and uh, Raphael Castle are the are the two main stars. Have you heard of this movie or seen this movie? We've we've talked about this movie in our private lives. It's number 14 on my list. It is. Okay, cool. I couldn't remember if you'd, you'd seen it or not. But yeah, I really like that movie. Very um, good. Raphael Castle. I wish he would do more stuff without David Diggs because he's awesome. And I only see him in stuff that David Diggs is also in, like like The Good Lord Bird, which is a great miniseries starring Ethan Hawke. Mm. Um, but, but they're both in it. Oh, right. Uh, number three is a movie we've mentioned uh, several times on this podcast today is Roma. That's my and number 20 on my top 20 list. Nice. Uh, number two for me is The Favorite, which, again, we've also mentioned a couple of times, mm -hmm. uh, Yor Yorgos Lanthimos. Mm -hmm. And then my number one is Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Cool, cool, cool. Great movie. Uh, it yeah. also appears on my list. I'm just going to mention a couple honorable mentions. I'm going to mention Vice because I think people crap on that now and have kind of soured on Adam McKay. But I, I think mm -hmm. Adam McKay's comedies or his like political comedies are very good. I like Vice. My number 17. It's my number 18, The Sisters Brothers, a movie with John C. Riley and Joaquin Phoenix, directed by uh, Jacques Audiard. I liked it. Yeah, I loved it. That's another one I saw on an airplane and was like, holy crap. That's my number 13. We mentioned some of these other ones. Tully. I really like Isle of Dogs came out that year. Yep. Another Joaquin Phoenix movie, Don't Worry, He Won't Get Far on Foot. Yep. I like that. Um, love that a lot. That's That just misses my top 10. So my top 10 are Leave No Trace. Mm. Um, we mentioned it a bit earlier, the... Uh, Thomason McKenzie, Ben Foster movie directed by Deborah Granick about really good, yeah. Uh, yeah, a guy and his daughter living in the woods. 
trying to stay off the grid. Number nine is uh, Women at War. The I mentioned it before. It's about a woman who's like an eco terrorist. It's an Icelandic movie. Really, really good. Number nine is an or number eight, excuse me, is Annihilation. We talked about this last week because I meant we uh, a bunch of us, our guests, and I brought up Stalker, and Annihilation is quite similar to Stalker. Number seven is The Favorite. Enough has been said about The Favorite. Number six, Spider Man into the Spider Verse. Great. Number five, Mission Impossible Fallout. Uh, number four, I'm going with Can You Ever Forgive Me, the movie that Melissa McCarthy was nominated wow. for Best Actress for. I, it's my I, number 19, but yeah, I really, really like it. Incredible. Uh, number three, Avengers Infinity War. I think kind of by a, not like the widest margin, but because Endgame I like a lot too. And um, uh, Thor Ragnarok, I think is very good. The first Guardians of the Galaxy, Spider-Man No Way Home. Like th- there are there are a handful of MCU movies that I think are actually quite good. This one, I think it really stands out. Uh, number two is mid 90s. And number one is, and it, I know it couldn't be on your list because you only gave me features, but my number one is Won't You Be My Neighbor, the Mr. Rogers documentary had me bawling on a date. I did not end up seeing her again, although it all worked out because I married a wonderful person. So less of a bummer in hindsight you certainly did and and i would i do have a separate list of documentaries from 2018 and that is my number one documentary of the year so i i share that love i think won't you be my neighbor is not just one of the best documentaries but maybe for me it's my favorite documentary ever made but Mm. it's one of the best movies i've ever seen incredible it, it, yeah, the the emotion. I mean, I remember seeing it uh, and, and almost from the, the very minute, like when he first just says, you know, like when you first hear his voice, it just like it just stirs up something. And he just because I watched him as a kid, you know, and it's just there's just so much attached to just the sound of his voice, you know, like, hello, neighbors or, you know, like, hello, children. It's just like, oh, my God, it just. uh yeah, it's beautiful. It really is. Um, I'm curious, where is it on Letterbox Top 250 mm-hmm. Documentaries of All Time? It is number 47, which I think is that that's good. That's a good spot for it. Top 50, yeah, is a, that's nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, for sure. I've only seen, oh, number one is a movie we've talked about on this podcast. Stop Making Sense. Oh, yeah, great movie. All right, well, thank you for spending time with us covering 2018. We'll be back next week to talk about 2023, but not two movies from 2023 because we've already done that we did barbie and oppenheimer but 2023 as a whole our predictions for the oscars and then some love for films that uh didn't get nominated for any oscars if you want to know what is coming out next week go to our letterbox profile you can find me at brad garoon on letterbox i think jake you're jake ziggler on letterbox yeah it's uh yeah jake underscore ziggler and both of us have pinned to our profiles our never did it podcast list you could also just search for the never did it podcast list and the two movies that will be discussed on next week's episode are always at the top of that list we have a facebook page now as well you can check that out at uh, facebook.com slash never did it podcast i'll be posting on that with uh, new episodes and uh, just fun updates from time to time about what we're watching and what's coming up so check that out and thank you for joining us for never did it hold on one second my cat the cat got a ping pong ball and he's going crazy hi laszlo